seeing his uh, bio, you know that he's as of 2006, he was under 35. Since he was nominated a top innovator under 35 in the MIT 2006 list. Let's welcome Professor Basu, or Dr. Basu. <laughs> Not yet, but. talking today mostly about our experiences in the uh, Dark for Disruption Tolerant Networks project and some thoughts as to where the research could lead to and uh, how academics uh, can play a role there. Uh, so I've been talking about routing and content-based content -based access. So I have to apologize that this, because of the Dark public release process, the 60-day public release process, there will be some spotty uh, spottiness in the latter part of the talk, the content-based access. I had put my slides and prepared my slides in, but my boss, when he looked at them, he said he cannot talk about this, this, and this, because we haven't done public release for it. It's a completely open program. It's not classified anything, and I am on a visa, but still, they are a little, since these slides will go online, uh, on the web, they don't want to do that stuff. But I would be happy to chat one-on-one -on -one later on. So I should point out this is a joint work with uh, Rajesh Krishnan, who is the PI of the project and the research lead. Uh, Ram Ramanathan, he did most of the routing work um, on the group, and Richard Hansen and Regina Ruz LSA, who also did some of the routing work. So uh, here is what I'll be covering today. First, I'll be talking about why ETNs and what's the interesting feature there. Uh, then I'll go on and describe what uh, the Dalbo DTN program is and uh, what, what was our experience in phase one. So the DTN code name for that is Spindle, which is survivable policy influence networking, disruption tolerance through learning and evolution. So to give a uh, tongue-in-cheek uh, version of that, we at, at BVN, whenever we write proposals, there is a small group of people who try to come up with cool names. And there is some effort specified to, because you want to tag a project. You don't want to say DTN, you want to say something else. The learning and evolution originally was real learning and evolution, now it has been social, social learning. Uh, so uh, the meat of the talk mostly will be adaptive DTN routing algorithms and uh, a declarative knowledge based architecture which we are working on. It. It's, that part is actually pretty interesting what you can do with it. In particular, as we're talking about date binding and give a brief uh, description of how we are doing content based access to that pattern. So, why DTN? So, the observation is in the last five, six years, there's lots of new types of networks that are cropping up. So, a few examples are dynamic tactical management, which is not really new, but that's at least one of the older ones. Sensor networks with sleep wake scheduling. Interplanetary internet, which is ITN, uh, started by Bill Sturk in 1999, Bill from uh, James and NASA, and that's actually the precursor to the weekend program. Briefly described it. And underwater networks and acoustic models, which is the C Web program and CNAS program in Dalva. So and, and also social networks. So these networks have this peculiar property that uh, they often lack availability of stable end-to-end -end paths between the source and the destination. Unlike IP, uh, regular IP network, uh, wired uh, IP network, and even well-connected managed, which uh, uh, although they are mobile, you still have a connected path. However, they often have something which is eventually connected over space and time. So, because of that, I mean, the current routing and transport protocol, they are unable to use that feature. That they are connected over space and time eventually, but they are not connected at any point right now. So, because of that, things break. And the solution uh, which was proposed is DTN, which is essentially the intelligence storage power routing in one sentence. There are several layers, so I mean, if you feel it, but that's a one sentence definition. So, uh, I'll give a very quick uh, uh, schematic of what it is. 
The goal is to facilitate reliable message delivery over space and time in the network, which we call episodic or intermittently connected. Uh, but that is the norm. So let's say source S has to send a message to destination D. And uh, there may be a brick wall between them, and because of that, D and D cannot communicate. So and even if D can communicate with X, SD don't, uh, doesn't have an uh, end-to-end path. Oh, uh, so bundle is this term used to uh, talk, me, talk about application layer messages on top of um, any underlying transport layer. So a bundle, for example, can be up to four gigabytes long in the specification, bundle protocol specification. You can send a DVD to Mars, that's their, that's their thinking, eventually. Uh, so, and you can send it by whatever means you want to send it. You may not be transmitting over a link. You may actually send a messenger to Mars. And that's a link in DT. So, we take the bundle in a CD ROM, go drop it into the disk on the, on the computer on the other side. That's a link in DT. So, uh, but apart from that aside, so when the bundle for D uh, is sourced at S, a regular manual routing protocol would say no route to host popularly known as NRTE, if you look at logs, and we just get dropped at the source. Nothing else will be done about it. Even if Z is later supposed to go towards Z, and uh, it will have a link with D, there is, uh, the manual routing protocol doesn't know that, and uh, even if we know that, it won't be able to uh, take advantage of that. So, so the thought is that this is a requirement which may be too stringent for uh, episodic networks, where uh, it will result in high message loss. So you somehow either have to use that knowledge that you know that C is going to go over to D, or you be more conservative and somehow uh, make progress in the network. So here, in the DTN version of this uh, routing problem, the link between X and Z appears. There's a bundle for D. It knows that there is no end-to-end -end path. But it still goes to Z, and as you expect by now, when Z goes to D, the bundle will uh, be sent to D. So how this happens, that's the real research, that uh, somehow you have to know that the SD path is eventually transported. And I'll, later on in the talk, I'll talk about a few classes of DTNs that exist uh, with various degrees of complexity. Uh, but the important point is that you use store and forward uh, and did not make a decision, a major decision at the source that we don't want to trust. So now I'll give a brief overview on what we did in the DTN1 program, that's phase one. So the history there is that uh, it started off with, in 99, an interplanetary internet by Wayne Surf and Adrian Book. And uh, it was. It used to be called then. Then a research group in IETF was formed, which is called DTNRG, Disruption Tolerant Delay Tolerant Networking Research Group. Now, Windsor then went to uh, the director of DARPA and said, "Much of the problems we are looking at in this interplanetary space, they are related to orbital dynamics. So things are very regular, and it's delay. Uh, we, the protocols are delay tolerant." But if you, if you take it to the US uh, tactical force, uh, if you intersect it with the tactical force requirement, the D has to now become disruption tolerant. It's not just delay where you know that you can schedule ahead of time, but you have to plan for disruption. Because mayonnaise, uh, they showed by FCS Farms, which was another uh, sponsored program in the early 2000s, they showed that there's a lot of flakiness in the mayonnaise and you never have an end to end pack, or occasionally at least don't have an end to end so you need to have some research which leverages the DTNRG work and uh, uh, solves it for the manic context or a, or a dynamic disruption uh, context. So hence DTN phase one was born and Vivian was involved as, uh, as were Georgia Tech, uh, UMass Amherst, uh, Lehigh University, SRI, and uh, Park. They were all involved and they're still involved in phase two. All of them. Uh, but we were tasked to demonstrate this goal, that on a 5x4 on a uh, grid, 
with uh, when links are flapping, uh, they're only available 20 percent of the time. We're supposed to guarantee 100 percent delivery under steady state. Uh, so in a real system. So that's when it becomes interesting. What do you mean by real system? So DTNRG has this uh, reference implementation, which is called uh, uh, DTN2. They have this whole protocol stack sitting on top of uh, TCP IP and uh, Ethernet and uh, any, anything, any underlying transport layer you can use. So they solve the routing and the forwarding problem in the application layer. That's how it started. Now they're trying to push it down into the kernel. But so using that uh, code and, and trying to uh, add on research components to it, we had to show that in a dynamic uh, 20 node network, you don't drop a single path. So the link characteristic that we used was similar to the SYNCARS radio capacity, 19.2 kilobits per second, a very challenged network. So these, are, these fall into the challenge network category. Uh, delay was kind of uh, not that high, uh, 5 milliseconds, and then to you and all that. I won't go over all the details. But uh, so there were there were some flows which were quite long, which were like six to seven hops long from one corner of the network to another. And the availability uh, values are also mm, sort of uh, uh, modified as you go on. Yeah. What was the size of the queue? So, so the queue, so normally the queue size, we were supposed to track it. So there was no boundary on the goal. That the goal didn't say you have to deliver with a particular queue size in mind. So it was like, you you have a steady state, you inject a packet at a certain rate, and you the injection rate, the queue size, is such that it never overflows. So it's like, uh, you're not constrained by the queue size, at least in phase one. Now in phase two, there imposes a certain restriction that you have to also play with how, what, can, what, what the best you can do to cut it out. But in this, in the results I'm presenting, I think there's a big priority that this is a feasible problem. Um, we don't. No. It's, yeah, it's, the only thing we know <coughs> is the, there is a certain, that the link, when it goes down, it will come up later. Mm -hmm. So with a certain statistical... Uh, but you don't know if I wrote, for example, what is the best you could probably do. Yeah. That's right. We don't know, we don't know that. Uh, we have uh, certain algorithms which, uh, where you, which is like God routing. So you publish the schedules in advance, and you say, what can you do? The shortest path routing you can do over space and time over this. So you can think of it as uh, a layered graph that you have a time t equal to zero. You have a certain communication pattern, and then you add another dimension to that, mm -hmm. which stacks these things up. So the new links appear and new links disappear. Along this axis, the dimension is storage. So all nodes, node one, all through will be connected like that. Node two will be connected like that. Mm -hmm. So your real routing problem is to find how you do that. It's to move forward. So uh, it's sort of a volume type argument. People have studied that? People have studied that. Uh, what people have not done is under queuing restrictions. So there's a, there's a classic 2003 sitcom paper by Sushant Jain and Kevin Paul, which gives, it's the first paper on DTM. They try to study some of these uh, techniques, not in the way I described. Uh, it's more of an optimization, flow optimization problem. That you, they try to model it as a multi-commodity flow between um, any two nodes in the network. And uh, how does that multi but Then that's just a formulation. Then they say this is too complicated. And uh, you're not going to use it, you're going to use some Excel. So, but you guys could read that and we'll get it over here. Um, before I get into uh, some of the later meat of the talk, here is what we used and, uh, to do the evaluations. So, we used, uh, instead of line, uh, putting 20 nodes in a row and actually making them, setting up wires and uh, doing the dynamics or even uh, sort of uh, doing wireless dynamics, we decided that we can get most of that because most of the challenges were in the software aspects of things. So we decided to use this thing called uh, user mode Linux. Uh, 
uh, of with NS emulator on this big gigantic box where you put 20 nodes of, uh, I mean every node has a full network stack in the server box and the, the logic actually, the interesting part is how they talk to each other. So when, when a node 1 has to send a message to node 2, determined by DJM routing as well as the top, it will just drop it on the bridge. And apart from these 20 processes, which are sniffing for the packet, there's another process by NSE, which is real-time NS emulation, which will emulate any network topology. So you can emulate links, mobility, dynamic, anything in there. Uh, since we did not do wireless, NS2 was not that bad. We were, I mean, it, it is well known that NSE has some problems in the wireless channel model, but this was a pure dynamic type simulation, so it was not uh, it was an arbitrary choice and it was a good one, I think. So then, essentially, the, you can set up firewall rules in the bridge, and you can say who gets packet from what, uh, from which node, and NSE determines how late should that packet be because of the disruptive tolerance simulation and it pulls it up onto the bridge and the node which was supposed to receive it, receives it. And so this is all uh, like, uh, it's, we haven't made it available yet, but because it's, there's some packaging issues there, uh, licensing and packaging, but other than that, it's a very end-to-end -end process that you just give a topology, you give a traffic pattern, and you get plots like this, that how uh, for things like that behave, or the link and everything. So something that, uh, like a link pattern, this is one of the plots. Uh, so each of the links, there are 62 links in the network, and each of them have a pattern, up-down pattern like the one on the left, and this is a zoom in of that. So note that so if you if you look at at any particular time, uh, only half the links, about 16, uh, were up at any particular time. And this is an interesting problem that you have, how do you theoretically, we didn't spend too much time doing that, but if you have this availability stochastic variable, and if you are intersecting across the whole network, that how many links at, at most? So we were trying to minimize this value, 16. Uh, that how low can you go by without changing the 20% 20, 20 thing? So by changing the schedules of the links. This is a random uh, pattern. So we came up with the adversarial uh, link dynamic pattern where you essentially color the graph by staggering the opportunity. And in here, we found that you can't go lower than 10. At most 10 will be up at any time. Or sorry, uh, uh, that's the maximum. You can't uh, go lower than that. So it's staggered enough that the, the final cumulative uh, availability is, uh, is shown by this green fingers. So we will see that how that impacts uh, the routing protocol performance. So this is a snapshot of the results we got. For so the protocols here are uh, the ones which do not take overhead into account. This is like flooding type protocols that you put as soon as you get a packet, you put it on the link first link that's put it, uh, that comes up. So even with that, the, green, the blue curve is VTN and the red curve is end-to-end -end TCP. So it says, uh, wait, 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 until you get an end-to-end path from source to destination. And that occasionally happens because it's a stochastic process. You will get an end-to-end path once in a while. So because of that, TCP does, after point three, it's actually, uh, like the traffic pattern we set it to, you'll always find an end-to-end -end path. There's no bond of delay. How long you'll have to wait to get that path? And that's reflected here. That uh, uh, you may have to, at point three, you, uh, here actually it goes off. I don't know, I haven't plotted that. At point three, you may have to wait forever, like more than an hour, to find an end-to-end -end TCP path. But in the delivery ratio, it's not reflected because uh, even if you got it at some point, you'll count it as a success. Uh, of course, if the if the if the traffic if you have to measure steady state, then there is an argument whether TCP is as good as it is shown. It's probably lower. But we just got went for a finite sample of what is, and that's the result. In case of adversarial link dynamics, it's much worse 
because then you are deliberately setting up these links such that you don't have end to end packs often. So you get end to end packs only when the more than 50% uh, links are available. Then TCP starts ramping up, whereas DTN is uh, really good in the beginning. The, at very low availabilities, DTN also has bad performance because we cut the simulation off at a certain time. So uh, for those low availabilities, the average time to reach at 7 hops is so long that the simulation time, and this is real time simulation, 3600 means 1 hour. So it took, uh, basically we just cut it off and uh, uh, because, mostly because of software related issues. The reference implementation has uh, leaks and things like that. And there's a utilization curve, which was another goal of the program that TCP does not utilize links that well. So TCP, uh, in, especially in long delay bandwidth product, I think it, it does not try to the slow start process, and because of all that, it does not fill the link of quickly. So they wanted some um, protocol which will actually fill the link up in steady state about 80% of the time. Now the notion of utilization is also a little bit hokey here because uh, what do you mean by utilization? Is it good port or is it uh, is it application good port or is it the network good port? Because you can, we have a flooding style protocol which will of course keep the links busy most of the time. So, uh, but I, I just presented that because that's an open problem. How to, how to optimize utilization in a student forward. Uh, yeah. How often no, are the packets generated around the nodes or some of the nodes? So, yeah, so everyone, uh, more than any pair, which is more than four hops away from each other, four or more hops away from each other, gets a packet to the other guy. So if I pick one, node one, yeah. then he'll pick all the nodes that are, it's, so the traffic pattern is sort of cross. cross yeah. Uh, in the uniform, uniform on these those on the four hops. On the other four hops, five hops, six of the seven hops. We had we had a bunch of results from all to all, but then it sort of um, it was even better. When we decided to say let's do the DTN. There's no use saying I have a packet for the next guy. That anyone even TCP can deliver. It. So we want to distinguish the regime to the DTN. So that's the regime where you have long paths. And you want to do student power. If the paths are short, then the probability because of the link dynamics, you'll have a two hop path occasionally right. quickly. So does this represent a worst case scenario in your mind? As far as traffic loading is concerned? I that's a good question. I I mean from a pure map point of view, I don't know. But intuitively yes. Is that adversarial point? dynamics with four uh, hops and more you know, is that represent a So that's the, so I talked a little bit about that. The practical case mostly in DTNs, as we are told now, is islands of connectivity which are well connected and highly flaky links between the islands, multi home, multi, I mean, multiple links, are reconnecting at the different points. But those, the islands themselves might move around and occasionally the islands may split and merge. But it won't be ever that the island, like a group unit or something will completely fragment themselves into single terms. It might be that there is one partition but then it merges again. Uh, however, the different group units are occasionally highly fragmented. Otherwise they have to, uh, the anecdote is uh, somebody had to call, use the SAT, um, inmore SAT link which is $13 a minute. So if you have to go across uh, from one piece to another and there's not enough density, you have to either do that or you have to wait for some guy to bridge the two islands. So that's where the trade-off, the cost trade-off. The link failure model is correlated then. The link failure model is, no, I mean, what do you mean? Some if you have islands moving around. Oh, that, yeah, in that case, yes. I don't know if, on Amtram, I don't know if you have a different view of you don't know you don't know right. But th this is the this is the yeah. the link failure was caught going on. Yeah. So what is presented here is really worst worst case, right? In, in the phase one, yes, that's right. And uh, 
So in phase two, we have this. Uh, we have to demonstrate this in a real uh, thirty-node network in four DPL, which is a military base. Uh, so there, I don't know what the link dynamics there will be. So it's like people driving around in circle or across the roads. So there is some degree of freedom, like the streets. You have to be on the streets. So it's not random or point of But I don't know what the link dynamics would. Or, or how will we get 20% availability? How we have to move so that average availability is 20%? That's not clear. But they think that 20% availability between these islands is a reasonably good thing to Yeah. Are these nodes static or are they consistent? phase one stuff. In phase two we have been doing like uh, manual like scenarios. So having DTM work on manual where you have mobility. Well, that's why you said islands moving. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we experimented with a few uh, protocols here before uh, we changed the direction a little bit. But I need to, I want to give a snapshot of that. So we have uh, P flood is pure flooding and replay, which is intelligent flooding. So those two are right at the top as you plot against the delivery ratio against availability. And uh, you have a random walk, which is a pure stateless algorithm. And you have quick crowd, which is a Dijkstra based schedule aware uh, algorithm, partially schedule aware algorithm. And hybrid is something which is uh, in the middle, which does random walk when there is. No transitive closure, destination is not in transitive closure, otherwise it has uh, quick run. So it's interesting that, yeah, random walk has a nice pattern, but uh, high break and quick route. Quick route uh, fails here because it depends on these link state updates, which don't work well <coughs> as they are normally known in, uh, in a manual network. Every time a link goes down, you say, spread, uh, flood this uh, information to everyone. Now, if you are lucky, if you are at that point, if you had a large size connected component, that will spread. Otherwise, it will die, and by the time it gets reflooded, it stays in position. So, so basically, the key, to the problem there is, what do you want to disseminate? Do you want to disseminate the current value, or do you want to disseminate some prediction, or some history, or some availability of the link on average? So that's what uh, it's sort of an obvious thing. But, yeah. So, what's the traffic rate generation? model here because I guess you know when it's about with delivery ratio it very much depends on how often you're yes. generating so the, so the traffic rate is uh, I didn't say it here so it's uh, in this particular run we offered uh, 40 bundles from each node to any node which is four hops away so every 40 bundles in in this simulation duration at random time so it's it's a low it's a low rate, but remember that the links are 19.2 kilobits per second. So, so I imagine that if you increase the traffic rate, then maybe this actual ordering changes. It could because the flooding yes. may not be that efficient. Anymore. Definitely, and that's why the yeah the flooding is not what we should, one should be really delving. You we should be wanting to move this up somehow. Similarly, so this is the overhead, um, the message com. So there it's interesting that flooding and uh, replicated forwarding, they have a constant overhead because you basically put every bundle on every link once and only once. Uh, so there are uh, four, yeah, uh, you can do the math. But the others, the random walk, initially it's it's very highly disconnected, but when, when you get a reasonable amount of connectivity, there's a lot of shuttling going on back and forth because it's random work. And it's it's not non it's not like non-recurring random work. Because if it's non-recurring random work, delivery ratio goes down. You need to have it shuttle back and forth, otherwise it may not ever reach the same. So you because of that it goes up and once the availability increases past the threshold, it does not do shuttling and it reaches the Destination. So that's actually one uh, theoretical problem which we are trying to 
look at what are the properties of random walk, uh, not in this program, but uh, what are the properties of conversions of random walk as you have increased the variability. Pretty much the same thing, I'll just give this slide. So here's a, an example of, uh, this is a real demo we created of six nodes um, put it on different uh, floors of the building. And it's a data collection scenario where you have three sensors which are disconnected from each other, two data mules circulating in uh, opposite uh, directions. And there is no end-to-end -end path. And the sensors want to send data to the headquarters. The green blocks indicate the of connection opportunities. So you really want the sensors to uh, wait until they have no choice but to wait until a data mule comes by. And the data mule can hand it over to the other data mule or it can directly deliver it to the headquarters. So, so the total availability is only 8%, but you tend to get a staggered step delivery type uh, thing here. In, in the previous case, the, the green curve was also pretty linear because there are so many links. Here, there are only some connection opportunities where inverse lot of bundles are delivered, either between data mules or to the headquarters. Uh, so if you wait long enough, you get delivery. But the interesting thing is that the emulator allowed us to simulate a mobile scenario. We just had to change uh, NS uh, parameter file and it did uh, all that. Okay. So, so here, uh, so then, th this is more our current thinking. So we, we decided let's step back and think what's, what are the different classes of DTM we are talking about. <coughs> One is an eventually connected dynamic network. So this, what this means is, at any point T, the network is connected. So if you wait long enough, you will, with a high probability, find the network path between the source and the destination. How you find that path, how you know that path, that's a different question. But there may exist a path. So if you start a diffusion algorithm right at that point, then your message will go through. Then the other class of network, the ERDN, which is eventually routable dynamic network, where the network may never be connected at all times. But the source and the destination may have a end-to-end -end path at some point of time. So it's different from saying, um, actually I have a graphic on it. It's different from saying that the network, uh, the network is connected. Because the network itself is fragmented, but source and destination are connected. And the third one is eventually transportable, where the network may never be connected. And the end-to-end -end path also may never be available, but there is a sequence of times over which you can um, uh, stagger the forwarding and do storage. That's the classic DTN problem. So, for example, an ECDN is uh, this network where, where there is a partition healing happening. And we started thinking like this because MITRE had this demo which exactly had this situation. And they called it DTN. They said there are two islands. We pushed a truck in the middle and the truck healed the partition. Then we said, wait, that's, it is DTN, but it's not DTN in the true storage forward sense. What you guys did is you waited until the truck appeared, and then you just shot through from here to here. So that's, a, that's DTN, but it's a different class of DTNs. Whereas, uh, and the other case is also uh, where, some, uh, where these nodes are moving in a, uh, in a circle, T1, T2, and T3, and uh, at any point of time, this guy can talk to this guy, so if this guy is located here, he has a path to it, although he may not have a path to it. So we, so this is a generic classification of that, and we try to characterize the routing mechanisms in these different, by these different sets of constraints. So there is path requiring, single copy, unavailable schedule, and bounded storage. These are the four different classes. Uh, orthogonal set of constraints that you can have. Path requiring means you need an end-to-end -end path to work. So it's a routing protocol property. Like DSR or AODB, the path requiring value is uh, true. Single copy means replication is not permitted. It's shortest path routing uh, destination. Unavailable schedule means at least one link. There is one link or subset of link activations which are not known in advance. So you 
don't know that our UAV will be flying over in future. But it does fly over, and we are not able to make I mean, make use of that opportunity. And then there's the ST, which is bounded similarly to the memory. So then you can think that you can have a possible combination of the first three, and it represents lack of the presence of these constraints. And each of these combinations will solve at least one of the types CCD and near the end of For example, path requiring true, single copy true, unavailable solution schedule true is a conventional manner protocol, like you have Whereas not uh, the archetypal delay tolerant network is you don't have the path requirement property. It is single copy and you have available schedule, so not of unavailable schedule. And epidemic routing is, it is, it does not require a path, it is multi-copy and there is no schedule required. So, there is a space where you can play, and it's just a taxonomy. Once you bring in replication and storage considerations, uh, if you, 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 could, you could say, uh, make statements like this. So, if a single copy algorithm which does not have, uh, which has schedule information, and it, takes to deliver, so this is a simplified version of the problem where only one uh, bundle is going through, for example. If, if that bundle occupies a uh, storage space of B, by it can solve a particular network on N nodes, then so, so can another routing algorithm, uh, which is multiple copy, which is not single copy, but it does not require schedules, and has a different storage bound, which is B N by H, where H is the hot diameter. So, and this is an existence thing, it's not and it's not a constructive thing. So, if a, so what that means is, if n by h is a, a reasonable number, then it would work for maximal copy. So, maximal copy, which means spread your copies, replica around, that will work for sparse graphs, where h is almost close to n, it's order of n. For dense graphs, h is not order of n. So, then that storage bond will go up a lot because you're replicating uh, all over. So, uh, that's one observation. And the other observation is, um, you have this purge, you have a frequency of purge messages, that once a destination gets a bundle delivered to it, and it waits for a certain time, then it creates this purge message, it's a list of everything that has been delivered, and it broadcasts that back in a back channel. And then you clear off the copies, the storage the limit on the, on the system at different levels. But remember that the purge message also ha happens on the same channel as the, uh, it's a VTM channel. So there are restrictions there. And we showed that uh, uh, multi-copy algorithm with, not, with no schedule available, with that delay bound, can solve a VTM with diameter, with delay diameter D. So delay diameter is an extension of the hop diameter where what's the maximum shortest delay between any two nodes in the network over a DTM. So, we just scratched the surface there, but there are some results that we're trying to get out now, which will uh, which sort of take these into account and somehow, uh, somehow bridge the gap between availability of knowledge and amount of replication you have to do. Then one another spectrum, you have lots of replication, no availability of knowledge. What can you do if you knew a little more? Why did you impose a single copy requirement at the outset? Uh, that's not a requirement, it is what most protocols, many protocols do right now. Mm -hmm. The LBB or uh, DSR, or most of those, they, they, don't, they only choose the ne one next card. Every time they do a round lookup, they will, uh, at least the vanilla version, they don't say that give it to different people. They'll say, this is the next card, and give it to me, that's about it. And the same thing happens. So it, so the message only gets transferred at, along one single line. Mm -hmm. It may be a very circuitous line, but it only gets put along one single line. Mm -hmm. Is there something known about in that scenario that you discovered about the variability of the length of the line? <laughs> no. I tried to, I, I don't know. That's a, uh, I tried to look at it from a random walk very simple random walk case where uh, you're trying to do a random walk on a on a grid with uh, sort of flapping legs. Mm -hmm. So one 
thing to say is that you stay on course, and it's a great, so it's an add on in, in distance, you know that you only go east or up, you don't go back. So there's a certain property uh, for that. But now if you drop that assumption, and you say that, send it to any node which comes up, any link that comes up, then you may have a longer path. And that, the length of that path is, uh, I'm sure there are results, but I, I, I couldn't do this now. I mean, yeah. Maybe for the grid it is, it's solvable easily, but for a general uh, network. So, uh, so here is something uh, how we try to bridge the uh, knowledge that you can gain by this kind of analysis into a real protocol. So how do you do epidemic routing, but with bias the epidemics are based on some schedule availability. So you say that you want to replicate the bundle to a set of uh, nodes given by capital R. And this so R is the degree of replicating, you don't want to replicate more than that in the whole uh, lifetime of the bundle. And P of U is that U becomes an eventual relay. So that's where the knowledge comes in. So this is this is very uh, sort of centralized reasoning and sketchy. It's not a protocol yet. But it gives us some estimate as to what we should do. So then the probability de of delivery becomes 1 minus the product of 1 minus PU, where U is an eventual relay. So if you knew somehow that X is going to be an eventual relay, or U is going to be an eventual relay, then uh, you use that one. Now, suppose that uh, each of the VRs have uh, VI through VR, their probabilities of being eventual relays are maybe loss of generality, less than that. So then we can say from this, it's trivial to see that probability of delivery lies between those two bounds. So then if you plot that, if you plot that function, what that shows is for any probability, uh, for a low probability of delivery, say 0.2, you of course need to replicate i uh, in order to do well in that probability of delivery. Thing. But if, if your p of u is high, then right from the get-go, you don't, your probability of delivery is so this is kind of intuitive, but it just shows the whole thing. So, so from this, what we figured that it's better if you bias the replication towards the destination. If you knew somehow where the destination is. So for that, okay, um, okay, before I go there. There is, uh, if you guys are interested, there is a lot of related work on DT and routing, and we classify them into these categories: uh, epidemic routing invariance, probability or contact history-based uh, routing algorithms like profit, MV routing, max prop. These are all in some of the last few Infocom papers where they take these contact profiles into account and uh, sort of use that to do DT routing. And then dissemination topology based, it's in the original sitcom paper by Jane, and a minimum expected estimated delay uh, paper, uh, where you can do shortest path, single copy routing based on that schedule information. Then there is an interesting class of papers for replication based uh, routing. This erasure coding, that how do you, if you have a large bundle and you don't want to retransmit it, so there's another dimension, the transport dimension, you want to chunk it up and do some erasure coding on it and then send it to multiple people. Uh, then there's spray and wait. So you give it to k neighbors, or k, uh, alpha fraction of your neighbors, and each of those guys wait until they find uh, some uh, the destination or somebody who says that you can go to the destination. So it's very, it's it's based on the gross gloss, gross gloss or say argument that you will be at most two halves away from the because you have mobility, and you're taking mobility as an account. And then there are others, which are uh, message ferries, um, <coughs> robots are moving around, they're just carrying your messages. It's cute, academic papers mostly. Uh, movie space, which is interesting, which is mm, mobility routing in a pattern space. So, so they create this n-dimensional space of mobility pattern vectors and say that every mobility pattern you can think of is one dimension in that space. And it's a huge multi-dimensional space. And then uh, you try to find a neighbor who has a similar mobility pattern to you. 
in that space, and you give it to that guy, and you hope that the message will somehow reach the destination. Again, they have proved certain nice properties of uh, restrictive mobility patterns. Uh, and then there is work on DTM multicast routing, which has interesting semantics to it. Like, what do you mean by multicast? <coughs> that uh, in DTM, in regular multicast, one person signs up for a group, and then he gets it, every message that comes to the group. In DTN, I signed up for that group today, but I'm totally disconnected. Then I signed off tomorrow. Should I get the message or not? So there are those kind of semantics issues there, and uh, uh, most of our models look at the Is a ratio coding a viable option here? Because normally it works well when the ratio probability is small, but here the ratio probability is very high, which means the amount of spraying you have to do would be it's enormous. Not, yes, it, I think. So this is again, uh, if I remember correctly, in sitcom 4 or sitcom 5, and uh, they have they use the economics based utility metrics. Not uh, they use some theorem uh, which is used by hedge funds to uh, to do resource allocation. So they do the replication allocation based on that. And I I don't know whether. Uh, it will work in general. The, the scenario was there's source, there's a destination, and there's a bunch of data mules going back and forth. And you don't know enough, uh, you don't know the schedules well enough, but you know that they are going back and forth. But you don't want to give it only to one of them. Uh, because, and the whole one will be one of them. So you want to jump it up and forth. In that scenario, it works, but it may not work in a scenario where source is also moving. So, in in our phase two work, the requirement is now that we have to come up with a protocol which works in uh, highly disrupted environments, but also works in highly connected environments, which is tougher than you think when, when you think first. Because normally, epidemic routing is basically the only thing that works if you are really disconnected and you have nothing wrong. But if epidemic routing completely doesn't scale if you go to a highly connected environment. Because before you can react, and the purge messages, before they can be forwarded, the actual messages have already spanned the whole network. So you have to find a sort of sliding scale of how you go between AODB and PrEP. PrEP is prioritized epidemic. So, in PREP, you actually manipulate the drop and transmit priority with uh, amount of knowledge you receive from uh, topology information. And in Apple's, you add a single path component which takes into account the well-connected scenarios. That if your cost to the destination is really low, then you don't do it. And it's a hybrid algorithm between uh, short single path and multi. So, um, so if you think about it as a module organization, uh, Prep and Apple both are routing protocols which which sort of pull from this slew of uh, building blocks, which are route computation, metric computation, dissemination of the metric, epidemic style dissemination of that metric, uh, and purge, which is also done using epidemic protocols. So. Each of them might say, I want to not do purge, but I want to disseminate uh, topology values. And I want to uh, do route computations on that. Or you could say that I don't want to do any shortest path routing, I just want to do dissemination. So you, you are on a cider scale in between that, and you choose which module you want to do. So this is more mostly a design. So in epidemic state dissemination, which is one of the components, you, you synchronize the topology epidemically rather than by flooding of link state messages. Because when a new link appears, when a new neighbor appears, if you, if you uh, depend on a flooding strategy, you essentially will only get the message which somebody flooded in the last period of time. You won't know what else happened uh, in that part of the network. But if you do epidemic sync, it's slightly more expensive, 
but in one shot, you will uh, you will know what I know and I will know what you know. So it will be an n squared exchange. That's the worst case, but uh, it works in uh, highly disconnected environments. So that's one basic unit of operation. That when Q and X are doing the same, Q sends Q different X to X, and X sends X different Q to Q. So and this subsumes flooding and uh, it is more complete than that. But it's of course also more uh, intensive. The other uh, block is purging, which is uh, um, a destination waits for a certain amount of time, collects what messages have been delivered, puts them in a purge message and epidemically disseminates that. So that all the nodes in the network who have been storing that one they will delete uh, that later on. So this is for us for alleviating the storage limits on the uh, on every node. Um, the rest of it is mostly details. So what prioritized epidemic does is it's primarily a multi-copy algorithm, but it uses shortest uh, the, the notion of shortest path to the destination in order to bias the replication to the destination. So there are two priorities, drop priority and transmit priority. So drop priority works like the following. If I have a, a shortest path to uh, a particular destination according to whatever topology I have gathered, and I know because because I'm collecting all the topologies from all the all the other people epidemically, I know what all my neighbors also have to the destination. So I I drop the packet if if essentially the bundles are farther from the destination than if they are closer to the destination. So essentially you are picking, you are biasing the replication towards the destination, but also allowing for the fact that you are doing epidemic, so you are not pure single shortest copy person. Because if you did single copy using that availability information, what if you were wrong? What if the availability information was not uh, true? What, what if future is not predicted by history? then a uh, single copy will fail. So to hedge those bets, we also, with a small probability, give it to the neighbors who are farther away from the destination. But, but, but still, bias it towards the neighbor which are closer to the destination. So that's the basic principle. And that sort of uh, generally works better than epidemic routing. We are still, uh, I'll show some curves, but uh, it all depends on how you actually set those priority rules for every network. So, uh, for example, here this is an application gradient under limited storage. So, if your max storage in every node was like two, and if there are three destinations possible, this is what you typically want to see. That near A, so between any two any two destinations, you should see bundles which are destined towards A and B. And this, so, between C and B, you should mostly see B, C, B, C, B, C. And between C and A, you should see A, C mostly. So that, that you want to achieve that in a distributed way. And you can achieve that by setting the priority rules. And if it's a single, if the max storage limit was one on every node, then you would only have A near A, C near C, and bundle distance for B near B. So these are uh, some very uh, preliminary plots uh, uh, for prep. So uh, this this is this is for a 25 25 mobile node random waypoint in a nine square kilometer area, highly highly fragmented uh, link dynamics. Uh, uh, it's usually very rarely. Been, I don't have curves for uh, connected component analysis, but connected components are very small in general. So uh, we do uh, the delivery ratio, of course, drops down as you as the offered load per bundle increases. Uh, and that is because of the storage limitations on every one, uh, on every uh, node. However, you see that prep, by, by even tweaking the priority a little bit, we start getting the separation. And uh, we saw even larger separations if you if you use more knowledge than before. And here, the knowledge is very limited. Like the topology of the knowledge we are using is just availability, historical availability of the link. If you have stuff like link delay, also, if you tag that onto the link to the then you uh, will see that. Uh, actually, I have a problem here. It's 
much about the group uh, when it actually goes on. Yeah. So the transmission range is uh, is the default NS transmission range. This is NS. It's 250. 250 meters. It is too small. small. So uh, in fact, if you you see the performance go up when you reduce the area. Uh, but 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 the the storage limitation we haven't really looked at if you have really low storage on every node and the range is high, then how does uh, priority play? Uh, from a systems point of view, people say storage, don't worry about storage. Storage is cheap. But that's true for the heavy duty uh, node sitting in the gig. It's not true for tensor mobile sensor. So it's really a heterogeneous problem, which, but since that has another dimension to it, we have to use that back. And this is the funny name, anxiety from the administration. So this is our attempt to show how you can adapt to this network, which is highly connected. Occasionally, if your traffic is within your island of connectivity, as I said, the model is the islands of connectivity, which are islands are fragmented occasionally, but not for a great amount of time. So you do DTN prep like routing across the island, but you do apples inside the island. How do you know that you have to somehow do a first cut is that you share that epidemic topology information if your cost is really low. And you can learn that somehow. You can use learning to see how big you are, how far off you are from there. But the first cut is the cost to destination less than an energy threshold. Then just route the bundle at one single cut. Don't do replication as But otherwise, you have to replicate. And so the initial thing is that, of course, the results are very sensitive to the energy threshold. And uh, the particular realization of the network and energy threshold, they all matter a lot. Uh, so, at some level, it becomes like a control, distributed control problem. You have to set drop priority, transmit priority, and anxiety threshold. And they don't have to be constant. You can actually vary anxiety threshold with kind of the now. So that, so that you uh, can bias these things properly. And uh, that's active to what we are doing. So this works when you don't care about the data? We do care about delay. There, there are certain cases that there are delay bonds. But if you are in the you can be able to do that. Yeah, so you have to, it depends on the application. Sometimes between islands, if you know that. Uh, Why is there a solution to bring the mobile uh, VAP or something? Yes, that's what I was going to say. But you do DTN over that. Yeah. So you do DTN over that. That's much faster and yeah. more effective. Yeah. So that's the notion of, and, and, and uh, that's more of an, uh, then it becomes an architecture problem. Like can your DTN stack to make use of these different new types of things, which is like UAV coming over. So the routing protocol should be oblivious to that. If someone puts that value in, that it will be able to So, uh, so most of the, this is the general, if, if you go to DTNRG and download the code, this is how it will look like. So this is the basic, DTM forwarder that exists and you can download it, run it on different machines. And what people are trying to do now is they're trying to externalize everything. So there's a persistent knowledge base where all the state about uh, packets, bottles, and uh, routing tables and everything is persistent, reboot sensitive. So it's put in here using an external interface. So by external interface I mean it's not invested into the code. So a new vendor can come up and say, here is my optimal solution for uh, storing persistent data. It's based on Oracle, it's super fast, and the other guy said, I can't run Oracle on a sensor network. It's a file-based persistent. But to, the, to this guy, it should not change every day. So he just uses a data store dot put, and it will just work. So that's the big focus that Preston Marshall in the program is trying to is a system integrator in the program, which is 
from the computer. And the other part is the convergence layer interface. The convergence layer means how, what's the underlying network connectivity. Government of the shares convergence layer, TCP IP, and uh, Bluetooth, Wi Fi, those kind of things. So if that profile is well known, there should be a way of a vendor who just puts that profile in into the system and by an announce protocol over a multicast group, the bundle protocol agent, VPA, will just know that there is a new convergence layer now with these linked properties and I can use it for routing. So you could, if it's a multi, it's a multi homing problem that you have, maybe a Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and uh, a TCP uh, over manually <coughs> and uh, you in comes a packet over TCP, over MANA, over Wi-Fi, and it goes over SATCOM. So that could be a particular way. And that switching will actually happen in the BPA, but the BPA for that switching will consult a decision plane uh, interface, which is again a piece of logic which sits outside. So this is a very tightly written up forward. It just maintains its data structure and has hopes for consulting a policy-based engine on the outside. So you can make that really fancy, or if you, you could make it like a random block router, stuff, stuff in green. Yes, but this is the overall architecture of the So uh, now I think it's, I'm running out of time, but I'll, this is some of the interesting stuff for the later part of the program. So we're trying to do, um, develop this declarative knowledge base architecture where you can capture things in schedules and uh, uh, discovered links, static links, predicted links, uh, opportunistic links, all those types of information and future information and uh, relationship between information in a rule based form. So it's kind of, we found that it's kind of hard to make a system which is non extensible. So we need a deduction engine right, to do at least, at least in the in, in big nodes, which are not sensor nodes, it's, it's hard to do all that without having a deduction engine. So you, so we decided to uh, have something based on uh, Flora 2, which is uh, which is a tool out of Stony Brook, which is uh, a deductive database. So you can insert facts about networks, names, uh, routes, and there are rules which say. Um, So these, these are some of the facts in that Florida Center we could input into the database saying this is a bundle, it's a frame, it has different facts. It's like uh, a regular object orientation principle. Uh, and here is a spindle adjacency is a link from node to node, name, all these attributes. When is it up, when is it down, what's the delay, what's the capacity, creation timestamp, modification timestamp, uh, convergence layer type, address, interface, all these different dimensions. So you can just put it in and it will stay in the persistent knowledge base as a fact. Now you can say things like this. S, for example, so there's a UAV which is flying over. S is the node on the ground. But at T equal to T now, someone told S that there will be a UAV flying over the ground. And here is the uh, trajectory of the UAV. So at that point, what you could use, do using Flora is, you can say a predicted link is a subclass of link. A link is an object which I described before, it was adjacency. And then you set up a rule, which I, I wouldn't explain everything here, but it says a predicted link between S and D can be derived, and their up and down times can be also derived if, it's prologue style syntax, if these conditions are true. If their trajectory is intersect and blah blah blah. Now the interesting thing is, at t equal to t now, a route planner can plan the route. It can just do transitive closure between s and uh, x and y. is based on all the link information in the database. So on demand, this rule will get executed, and it will say, okay, it seems like there's a UAV coming at this time, not right now, but since it's in the route database, I'll wait and I'll use that rather than doing something greedy and sending it to the next So we have tried some of these things and it's, it's good for, of course, the, it's soft, the software issues and things are not as fast as they should be. Uh, Stony Brook people are working very hard to uh, make it tight and easily fit into, because it's a logic engine, it's a full-blown logic engine. 
we don't need all the higher order logic and all those kind of things which we have. But we're trying to convince them to bring it down to a small profile so that networking people can do that. But then you can represent such things in a nice manner. And, uh, and this, these contents can also be shared. That I knew about this predicted link and I can tell you about that predicted link by just shipping this thing around. There are active networks concerned there, but, but you can still know what I know uh, by sending this rule around. So this is kind of um, uh, something which we plan to sort of investigate some more time. Yes. So if I send here both, so actually that rule does take the trajectory of both S and B into account. As long as you know the trajectories, which is not always the case. In case of UAV, it's probably easy, but in case of a mobile soldier, it may, not, it may be very highly. You may know statistical properties of it or not. So that's a harder problem. But you can say It's over the, on the network or on the network? No, are you doing it over the tracking? We are, and it's not, the networks are not la large enough yet to okay, estimate. I mean, if you do epidemic, it's the bomb is sort of known and it's, it's very high. The question is whether we can do better. No. We, we don't know that yet. Do you have to do epidemic or something? No, you can do small epidemic, you can do scope epidemic. Can do scope epidemic. In simulation, we have we have trapped it, but not in our analytic. This is the this is the final thing I'll be talking about. There's this interest uh, from the program to do something more than routing to an endpoint. So routing to an endpoint means I know the address of who I'm routing. Now they say route to the soldier who's standing within 50 meters of the south side of this bridge. I don't know who the soldier is, but I know those attributes. Or, or send, uh, send this bundle to a sensor in Death Valley who's recording temperature more than 130 degrees. So it's data, it's database naming and it's, there's a lot of work on it. It's the problem is DTNs complicated a whole lot. It's like what kind of information you share and timeliness aspects of it and uh, things go out of the state. If it changes, you cannot ever, uh, like it's routing as it is is hard and this is like another layer. So here, for example, uh, at node N1, you can resolve, there's a resolution process. So this is a generalization of DTN uh, name resolution, uh, DNS name resolution. In DNS name resolution, you have DNS name, out comes an IP address. Here, you have a complicated intentional name. So this is an intentional name. And out comes a, a name which the routing protocol can deal with. So, for example, here, I'm just showing it for, I mean, pedagogic reasons, that the next stop name came to N2, that N2 may know how to do this. N, N1 doesn't even know what is in Death Valley means. That, that's, that's a construct which is just a string for N1. If it knew is in, what is in Death Valley means, he could have routed it to a Death Valley sensor directly, but it does not. However, N2 does, based on uh, N1 going to uh, epidemic or whatever, and N2 knows what is in Death Valley means, he sort of blows it up and says, oh, this is another lifelong, this is bad, geographic routing. Uh, and it rewrote that lead binding the header. And the header is sort of moving along uh, as it's changing. And then, next up, name came to N4. And N4 knows that the real answer is N5 or something, because it's been keeping track, it's a sensor network. 
with the temperature gradient of and it just knows that um, according to the gradient and you see it's uh, M5 is the answer, answer for it. So the point here is that the endpoint names are queries, they're uh, any cast queries. So if there are multiple nodes to satisfy this property, say I'm doing a query on a database, select all this, uh, but give it to everyone who satisfies this query. That's the most general version of the problem. Now that is, of course, very hard, uh, even in connected networks. In connected networks, you can deal with it. So you know, it's really a distributed join problem. You have two tables. You have the is in table lying somewhere. You have the rest of the tables. Where do you do the join? And, and in network. You have to do the join in network, not on the source. So um, we are looking into, and they are interested in this and in this, and we are looking into this particular problem, like uh, geographical attributes, and, which make things simpler. If you say, I want to do it for any general attribute namespace, absolutely no aggregation is possible. But if it's geography, at least you can aggregate on the geographic values. So, uh, the, uh, the nodes are aware of their geography? Uh, some of them will be. I was talking to Richard about this earlier. Some of them, at least the soldiers outside, they, are, they should be. They have this 80 pound backpack. <laughs> and uh, most of it is occupied with batteries. They have GPS information. However, indoors it would not work. So there is the other. Uh, so localization might. You may run localization algorithms to figure out uh, or at least statistically bias. Um, I have some other stuff, but this is sort of the meat of the talk. And, uh, I think I can stop here. Thank the speaker first. Any other questions? Do you allow for multiple types in the Yes, so uh, yeah, before you came, we tried uh, to trade off between a single copy on a, on a available schedule versus multi copy and another. So we don't do multi path in the sense of multi path source of it, but more like a replication style. So, what do you use for replication? For replication? I mean, so oh, oh, so, so we, we have a topology awareness model which says average link availability in some of them describes that. And then we say that if my neighbor, to, among all my neighbors, I, I replicate to a neighbor who is recording a shorter cost. But we, I don't say that don't replicate to the other side. Because there are two bins. So don't one. do so, uh, schedule replication no matter what. So that you try to minimize something like response time for anybody who will want to do it. We don't do that yet. No. But uh, what, we, what we have is we have two bins, downstream bin and upstream bin. We said put it in the downstream bin. If this guy is increasing the cost, put it in the upstream bin. And that is to protect ourselves from the fact that if the topology of the is old, then this would never work. So, yeah, that seems to be, we still have to, but this depends on all the. So, what exactly is the topology of the Right now, we have uh, average availability. So we, uh, average availability of a particular uh, neighbor. So, we keep track. Uh, the neighbor discovery protocol uh, exchanges that always. So, I say, uh, how, how long did this? We do the files for floating to find quite a bit of Oh, this is not that low. So since this is higher, oh, so what do you mean by availability? Oh, availability of the link means uh, when do I think? So I, I got a hello from you. So I'll expect until, I mean, with some, if I'm getting hellos from you periodically, I'll expect the link is on. The power of reception of the hello is in this Not in this model. So this is what you have in the zero process. It is a zero process. But, but the average availability has this history. So the history is so it could be a real number. But it could be or it be off if the power is just short of. So but once you have that, all the logic going through, all the sophistication will go into 